We should have a little advertisement while we're getting it all together here. See. Well, happy Valentine's week, everybody. Thank you. Thank we're here you. to talk about that today. It's a time to celebrate love in all ways. So I have a Valentine poem, and this is really dedicated to Flo. I wish she was here today. She's in California. You know, Flo, if you're out there watching, this one's for you because we all know Flo loves purple, right? So here it goes. Roses are red, violets are blue. So why they're called purple or violet, I haven't a clue. All right, it's not that funny. I kind of blew the punchline there, but maybe I should go to Dolly Parton. She probably has a better one. If you live in Tennessee, you have to go by Dolly Parton, right? She said once, love is something sent from heaven to worry the hell out of us. <laughs> if it's Dolly, it must be true. Anyway, what I really want to talk about today is the Bible has the passionate love poem. Passionate. The first time I read it, I was both shocked and pleased that such a poem could be in the Bible. I couldn't believe it. And it's traditional that Solomon wrote it for his own wedding, and it's the passionate speaking between a bride and the bridegroom and the love they have for one another. Here's the first line. This is just the first line, depending on the translation you used. Kiss me. Make me drunk with your kisses. Your love is more delightful than wine. Wow, how's that? That doesn't make you read the Bible. Nothing will, huh? And the whole poem goes on and on, this passionate language between the bride and the bridegroom. Now, you can read this two different ways. You can read it as a beautiful love poem between two people that love each other. Or you can read it metaphysically in the esoteric language. It's a love between the soul and the spirit, between our human nature and our divine nature, that mystical marriage, when we finally realize our union with the divine. And so why did they write it as such a passionate love poem? Well, the Eastern people teach with stories rich with symbolism. And in the esoteric symbols, the bride and the bridegroom represent that mystical marriage of soul and spirit, the spirit being the masculine, on form spirit, coming into form, the feminine, receiving into form and manifesting on earth as it is in heaven in the realm of divine ideas. The one presence, the one power, working through both. So the poem goes on to say, I am the beloved and the beloved is mine. In other words, I am that I am. There is only one presence here. And when Jesus taught, he too taught many parables about love and the bride and the bridegroom. There was the parable he taught about the 10 bridesmaids and the bridegroom. It sounds like a reality show sitcom at first when you hear about it. But these 10 bridesmaids are supposed to keep the oil lamps all burning until the groom comes. And they have no idea when he's coming, but their job is to keep the oil in the oil lamps burning. And so metaphysically, this is for us. We have to keep that light burning in ourselves until our consciousness awakens to that. Oh, I am that I am. And we never know when that full awakening collectively is going to happen. We just have to keep our spiritual life going until it comes. It all began with that falling consciousness. You know, that beautiful song we sang, Let Me Remember, when we forgot. We fell and we saw through the eyes of separation and we've been trying to get back up to the kingdom of God consciousness ever since. Heaven is not a place you go to when you die. But it's been called that in many traditions. It's really an awakened state of mind. But in all the different traditions, Christianity calls that heaven. The Buddhists call it, and excuse the pronunciation on some of these, I'm going like they're printed, not how they're probably really pronounced. The Buddhists call it Bodhai. The Zen Buddhists call it Satori. The Sufis call it Fana. The Muslims call it heaven. The Taoists call it the ultimate Tao or Wu. The Hindus call it Samadhi. The esoteric saints call it the mystical marriage. New Thought people call it cosmic consciousness. And we Unity people call it 
the Christ consciousness. Now the Californians used to say they were the promised land for a long time, but that's a whole other message for another day. Moses led the people to the promised land, but Joshua sent out spies because he was supposed to go in and take it. And so he sent these spies into the promised land and they came back so afraid, they said there are giants in that land. We can't take it. They're giants. They make us look like grasshoppers in their sights. Now when we look at that metaphysically, the truth of our being and the power that it was within us is so big, we can't even imagine it. We can't even, it's beyond our reach. We can't take that greater reality. I had a personal experience of this in a dream one time. I think I shared this with you a long time ago. That I was on my farm I grew up in. We had an apple orchard and I was walking barefoot in the grass through the apple orchard. And all of a sudden there was a manhole cover. So I reached down to see what's under that manhole cover. And in the dream, out shout this pillar of light and power. It was like atomic power. And it was so big, so horrific. I immediately shut the manhole cover. And then I woke up and I realized, oh, I just tapped into my own power and I couldn't handle it. I immediately shut that manhole cover. And Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of Unity, spoke of that. In, at the village, they have a lot of his unpublished work. He said, when the children of Israel were sent over into the promised land to spy it out, they brought back only a small portion of the fruits of the land. They brought back grapes, pomegranates, and figs. Now that's what we do. We get immediately some of the fruits of the land. We touch into it. But most of us would be like those spies and say, that land is well fortified. There are giants in that land, and we are grasshoppers in their sight. In other words, we can touch and taste that part of us that is divine, but only in small amounts. This means we don't appreciate the power of our own spiritual ability. And we look at the kingdom of heaven as something that is beyond our reach. Charles Fillmore went on to say, great minds in the past and present have in their higher moments gone over into this kingdom and have spied it out, but they have not followed it up and lay hold of it. We settle for less, we taste it, but it's so hard to lay hold of that greater reality of our being. I can intellectually know it, but to live from that place of that higher reality. And we're all in this together. I know on Facebook this week I, I found this thing. Somebody posted, right now the world needs a group hug. And I thought, well, yeah, we do need a group hug because we've all forgotten. We don't know how to remember anymore how to lay hold of that greater part of our being. And the Song of Solomon, in poetic form, is coded, expressing as that yearning between two lovers, that yearning to end that separation and to return to that remembering of our union with our divine nature. Uh, I don't know about you other gals here, maybe the guys read it too. Anybody here read the book when you were a kid, The Secret Garden? was that one of your favorite little girl books. Loved it. And the secret garden, of course, metaphysically represents that garden, enclosed garden that is within us. And it's from the Song of Solomon. And when I was ordained, we had a unity class yearbook, and we were supposed to pick a Bible verse to go with our photograph, and I chose the Song of Solomon. She is an enclosed garden, my sister, my promised bride a garden enclosed. Because to me that meant I had it all within me. I can do this. <laughs> I was so naive. <laughs> I love that verse, you know, I can do this. I've got it all within me. And the whole idea of the brother and sister getting married, well that's esoteric language for the two aspects of yourself, the feminine and the masculine, the spirit and the soul, that enclosed garden that is always within. Well, I've been talking about love on Valentine's Day for years and years, 
And each year, I think, well, we're not going to talk about this year. And one year, I said to my own Valentine, Michael, I said, what can I talk about love this year? And he said, well, love is ultimately a celebration of the self. Ultimately, it's about loving yourself, your true self, your higher self. Remember when Jesus talked about love, he said, love God, love your neighbor as what? As yourself. If we don't love ourselves first, how can we extend that love and compassion to others? So how does that play out? Well, by being kind and gentle. I like that word gentle. Go easy on yourself. Be gentle with yourself. Sometimes we're harder on ourselves than other people. And be compassionate to yourself first and then to others. I grew up where if you thought of yourself first, it was being selfish, self-serving. Were you all taught that? And, yes. You know, we were raised right, how to think of others before us. But we have to fill up ourselves first so that our heart can overflow to others. And instead, sometimes we yearn for other relationships to fill us. Find your soulmate, your twin flame. We've all been there. Dorothy Elder in the book, the book that I'm taking this from today is called The Song of Solomon and Enlightenment, the metaphysical interpretation of The Song of Solomon by Dorothy Elder. I don't think she's with us any longer, but it's a classic book. And she said, our longing is often portrayed as a choice of a spouse. We try to find that perfect being, the one we choose to marry. How disappointed we may be. It's really the spouse and the divine marriage we're searching for. And until we find this soulmate, we should probably not find our outer perfect soulmate in that outer physical world. That only works when you're whole within, because as within, then without. The outer is just reflecting what you're carrying inside of you. And so the desert fathers who went out into the desert to try to find that part of them, used the Song of Solomon as a daily mantra. They read it every day. Verse 4, he brought me into the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. Remember that old song, his banner over me is love. That banner is a Jewish wedding canopy. Under the wedding canopy, that marriage again of soul and spirit. Dorothy Elder in this book, said the Song of Solomon has the same steps as a marriage does. She said it starts with the engagement. Verse 2, I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him but found him not. That searching for love in all the right and wrong places. Until we're finally born again or finding it in ourselves. And then we have the marriage practicing the presence in all and everything and everyone, wherever we are, God is. And then the consummation of the marriage, experiencing the truth of that union with the God, to lay hold of it, not just so I intellectually know this, but I'm laying hold of it in my life. I'm living my life now from that place. And then it becomes a life of service, extending that love to others, because love cannot be fulfilled without giving it out. And so let's go back to Solomon, if he was the author of this beautiful poem. Let's break his name down. Solomon. Sol means light. O means glory. And man means the truth. So it's the glory of the truth that we are spiritual beings of light. One with each other. One with God and one with all life. So this week, if you have nothing else to do, ha, 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 I recommend one of three books, The Song of Solomon and Enlightenment by Dorothy Elder. If you can find it, you might be able to find it on Amazon or on one of those used book sites. And then I found a new favorite this week. Uh, some of you have read uh, Roger Houston. He's got a whole series of books called Ten Poems to Change Your Life. I think when I first came, I did a book study of his book. Well, he now has a brand new one called For Lovers of God, Mystical Christian Poetry Around the World. And it's a beautiful book that takes all the mystical poetry, the Christian mystical poetry. I tend to prefer the, the, uh, the Sufi or the Eastern mystics like Rumi and Hafiz, 
But these are all the Christian mystics, and they all say the same thing. You know, I am the beloved, the beloved is mine. So the third thing, if you don't want to do one of those books, read the book, The Song of Solomon, also called The Song of Songs, from whatever Bible translation you have, as a valentine to yourself, or as a love poem to someone else, or as a love poem to the divine and knowing and awakening the union within yourself. How's that sound to you? Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, just read the first couple of lines. You'll love it, okay? Let's take it into prayer. God, we choose to remember. We call forth that spirit of remembering, that divine wisdom moving through us in every moment, awakening every thought in our mind away from the programming of fear and separation, releasing and letting all that go, and allowing the truth to set us free the truth of who and what we are, the power that is within us. We choose to lay hold of it, to live from that place of knowing the truth of our being. And we are so grateful with the support of each other today as we pray this in the nature of the Christ. And so it is, so it truly is. Amen.